Hey, uh, thanks so much again to uh, Mikkel and the organizers for inviting me and for putting on this awesome conference. And uh, thanks so much to Annette, that was fantastic. Um, and I'm really uh, pleased and gratified to be on this particular panel with people uh, whose papers overlap so much with my own. Um, so let's see, where did the... Ah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, my name is Salem Forty. I'm a PhD student at McGill. And my paper is called uh, Attention Ecology, Biological Metaphors in Post-Internet Art. Uh, so in, in the last decade, the digital mediation of lived experience has become almost universal. Even at moments when you aren't actually accessing the internet via your laptop, phone, or some more esoteric piece of personal technology like a Google Watch or Google Glass, uh, though I doubt any of you have those, um, it's likely that your movements and activities are being tracked, surveyed, converted into information, and algorithmically processed. What might surprise us is that the dominant trends that have emerged in philosophy within this same period, specifically those trends that have captured the attention of artists and curators, have been primarily realist and materialist, as opposed to previously dominant postmodern and post-structuralist approaches that foregrounded signification and language. Within the sphere of contemporary art, we might have imagined that the incursion of digital networks into every phase of production and distribution would have continued the process of dematerialization that conceptual art began in the 60s, or that subsumption within digital networks would mark the complete triumph of the society of the spectacle theorized by Guy Debord, or of the condition of simulation diagnosed by Jean Baudrillard, both of whom feared the colonization of reality itself by the power of the sign and the disembodied image. On the contrary, rather than the physical world being assimilated into a virtual world of coded signs and illusory representations, the erosion of distinction between the physical and the digital has meant that the internet appears increasingly material and thing-like, not an alternative zone of being, but something that permeates everyday reality. Writing in 2009, um, uh, critic and uh, curator Jean McHugh tried to periodize the post-internet condition in terms of the internet's mainstreaming following the advent of social networks and standardized professionalized web design and the consolidation of corporate and commercial dominance within online space in the mid-2000s. At one point, the internet was a technological and potentially utopian wild west for hackers, programmers, and nerds. Post-internet designates the point after which the internet became part of normal life for everybody. Um, the term post-internet wasn't coined by McHugh himself, but probably by artist Marisa Olson sometime between 2007 and 2009, maybe as early as 2006, reports vary. Um, perhaps not coincidentally, the art blog uh, Verk what, or work was founded in 2006 by a group of four artists, uh, Christoph Kriglinger, uh, Georg Schnitzer, Oliver Lark, and Alexander Lomanovic, uh, the latter two of whom have seen their own careers rise to notoriety in recent years under the banner of post-internet aesthetics. As a blog, uh, Verk itself wasn't explicitly associated with post-internet art, but it was an early and occasionally quite controversial demonstration of the new network dynamics to which image culture has been subjected. As, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Verk was a simple WordPress blog that posted documentation of artworks with virtually no textual commentary aside from technical explanations. It ceased operation in 2012. Uh, when it first started, though, the continuous feed of images with minimal context was pretty novel, especially since it preceded the arrival of Tumblr. Um, if I can just uh, this again. Here's a, a sample of, if you're scrolling through the, uh, it's still online, um, actually Rhizome uh, uh, digitized uh, the entire archive of work just in case it ever happens to go online. But I'm just scrolling through the uh, index for the tag assemblage, um, which offers, I think, a pretty apt um, example of the kinds of content that was posted on work. But, um, so often work uh, would post a number of visually similar images in a row uh, which function to suggest connections and shared interests operating across geographic or temporal distance. But it had the secondary effect of anonymizing art production, lacking contextual information about, oops, never mind, never mind, yeah. <laughs> lacking contextual information about the practices of individual artists, it suggested a hive mind. The simultaneous emergence of visually and conceptually similar motifs made it seem that styles and content were self-perpetuating memes for which artists were mere vehicles. As Michael Connor recently wrote, instead of arguing for artists' uniqueness, it argued for their interconnectedness. 
Verve depicted artistic production as a networked collaborative process subject to certain patterns, and it saw potential in iteration. It didn't hurt that Verve's editors gravitated towards a specific kind of work, which Sally Mackay described in 2007 as, quote, elegant sculptural installations crafted well from non-precious materials with interesting but tidy content and an unquestioning relationship to art institutions. Um, this particular tendency has been even more dominant on uh, Verve's unofficial successor, um, Contemporary Art Daily, a slicker and more professional site that borrows Verve's model of posting art documentation with minimal text, but focuses on reporting real exhibitions in full as they happen with a portfolio of exhibition, or sorry, installation shots. Um, and it's also worth mentioning sponsored links from many of the galleries who lose works they post. Um, Burke's modus operandi of aggregation as meta curating suggested that viewing documentation of artworks online could be a primary experience rather than being secondary to seeing the works in person. CAD formalized this by virtually transporting its viewers to current international gallery shows in more or less real time. In a, in a 2013 article for Artform, Michael Sanchez argued that CAD became, quote, a primary storage site for images of contemporary art around 2011, end quote. And perhaps more importantly, that a number of galleries sprang up around the turn of the decade, especially in Italy and Germany, that present shows more or less explicitly for distribution on Contemporary Art Daily and sites like it. Um, uh, this is a shot of uh, an installation view from Tanya Layton Gallery, um, which is uh, a frequent appear on Contemporary Art Daily. Um, but uh, in particular, Sanchez noted the circuit between the minimal text white screen aesthetic of CAD clearly meant to evoke the white cube, and the tendency within new galleries to employ high wattage fluorescent lights, which themselves mimicked the backlit clarity of iPhone screens, while facilitating more eye-catching documentation for online viewing. Some critics have noted that such work seems calculated exclusively to look good in online documentation, and often looks shoddy or unimpressive in person. Brian Drotkur wrote in 2014 that, quote, the post-internet art object looks good in a browser, just as laundry detergent looks good in a commercial. Detergent isn't stunning at a laundromat, and neither does post-internet art shine in the gallery. It's boring to be around. It's not really sculpture, end quote. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Michael Sanchez pointed to a major shift in the temporality of art viewing affected by the availability of constantly updated feeds like CAD. In fact, the logic of the real-time feed has become pervasive, shared across social media platforms and apps of all kinds. Whether on your phone or computer, you don't even need to refresh an app or a browser page for most services notifications pop up without you having to check for them. The model of the feed installs anxiety and anticipation as a permanent condition. You know that more information is always on its way and could change or compromise the information you have in the present. The consequence of this for art distribution is that established cyclical rhythms of art discourse based around print media and recurring large-scale exhibitions uh, like biennials are liquidated in favor of instant, constant screen-based mediation. Um, to quote Michael Sanchez one more time, uh, it may seem that one obvious consequence of this process is that consensus can now be built much faster in a matter of hours rather than months or years. Yet this increased speed also disables the judgment element of consensus in favor of collective attention. What had once been a process of legitimation attributable to particular institutions or critical bodies now becomes a process of simple visibility attributable to the media apparatus itself." End quote. So the media apparatus he has in mind here is not so much the internet at large as the ubiquity of personal devices like the iPhone, which, like contemporary art daily, hit a major point of market saturation around 2011. It became possible not only to be connected to the internet at all times very easily, but to have high-speed access to high-resolution images at your fingertips on the touch screen of a phone or tablet. By the mid to late 2000s, many artists were already entirely conscious of these conditions and were producing work optimized for the technical apparatus constituted by feedback between the screen, the feed, aggregators like FERC and CAD, and the established circuit of print, museum, and gallery. Within such rapid networks of circulation, the interpretive context of art discourse ceases to matter nearly as much as what a, as what a Delusian might call an image's affective intensity and what a BuzzFeed editor would call its win, lol, or oh my god factor. Mm -hmm. The important thing is to make an impact, to attract eyeballs and attention. Art in this scenario becomes a kind of meme dependent on viral circulation. <sighs> and the concept of a meme, as Sanchez reminds us, quote, derives from Richard Dawkins's biological account, or biologistic account, of how genetic and non-genetic data spread, like viruses, through their corporeal transmitters, end quote. Human eyes, brains, and bodies become conduits for the perpetuation of art, 
which takes the form of visual information but acts like an organism in its own right. For a number of younger artists associated with post-internet aesthetics, biological and organic processes like natural selection have seemed like a better way of accounting for the behavior of images within network circulation and distribution than most hitherto dominant art theory, which, since structuralism and post-structuralism, has mainly been based on a textual model of meaning and focused on issues of representation and the social construction of identity and ideology. By contrast, the artists I want to discuss are more interested in the agency of images and objects themselves, their anonymous capability for self-perpetuation, mutation, and replication, as well as the aspects of art viewing that might be determined by the confluence of biophysical and technological factors. There are at least two overlapping ways in which these ideas have manifested. One is a thematic concern with the emergence and persistence of forms across evolutionary timescales. It's common to see work on contemporary art daily that looks like hardware from a sci-fi film or the ruins of an alien civilization, or both. Here's one of uh, Nicholas Cicaldi's works, which is an elaborate housing for a security camera that uh, was trained on the gallery at all times during the exhibition. And below is uh, Katya Novitskova's Pathfinders, uh, for which she, she digitally printed images uh, taken by robots on the surface of Mars onto um, broken terracotta pots. Um, and the images, and the particular images from the Mars satellites that she took are, are not from NASA themselves, but from conspiracy websites that have little diagrams of people finding like, I see an alien, I see people on the surface, I see something other than robots. Um, but in, in both of these works, and the, the kind of body of work that they represent, this conflation of the ancient and futuristic evokes a kind of neo-romantic sublime sense of the vast millennia. It suggests the erosion of meaning and interpretability in the face of either inhuman duration or inhuman technology, and seems calculated to induce awe, fascination, or even a kind of aesthetic horror. Novitskova's work in particular is emblematic of the tendency towards the theme of form as something evolving and persisting outside or beyond human cognition and intention. Her artist's book, Post-Internet Survival Guide from 2010, was uh, an early Bible for this kind of aesthetic and uh, a sort of updated whole earth catalog for the post-internet era, and actually one of the earlier articulations of post-internet as a term. Um, Novitskova has continued this stream of investigation in her ongoing series, Approximations, uh, which consists mainly of images of animals digitally printed onto cardboard or aluminum stand-up displays like you find in retail merchandising. Uh, these references uh, to animal physiology these reference animal physiology as evolved form, a kind of aesthetic and uh, functional success story that we can appreciate on a formal level, while also incorporating the evolutionary psychology idea that strong reactions to animals are hardwired into human brains. In a lecture at the Serpentine Gallery's Extinction Marathon in 2014, Novitskova marveled over the mammoth infrastructure fueled by the physical attention of people looking at pictures of animals on the internet. It's one of the biggest drivers of web traffic, along with porn. Um, and this legitimately actually takes a huge amount of energy and space in things like data centers and like actual consumption of electricity. Um, but she's also described how people almost subconsciously pull out their phones to take pictures of these works of hers, which inevitably then get recirculated through networks again. Um, a corresponding aspect of this series is the extinction of animal species and the replacement with technological objects, about which Nabitskama is remarkably sanguine um, when she first showed these particular works in 2012, a text accompanied them. Um, I'm going to read it. It's a, it's a longish quote. Um, thousands of forms demise each year, and thousands are born anew. For every extinct butterfly with a unique wing pattern, a silicon wafer is printed. For every dying mosquito, a digital image is uploaded. Fueled by human attention and primordial carbon, these massive populations of info matter are roaming the earth. Recovery and prosperity, the two successive phases of an upcoming economic expansion, will be marked by a rise of unseen species. So specific will be the ecological reality that we cannot predict their agency. What we can do is render our emotional energy to these beings, or render our emotional energy these beings will need to feed off of, a map of formal intensities unfolded from art and commerce. After months of neurochemical translation, an ancient signal emerges, an animal, bonding, end quote. Um, so the reference to commerce and economic expansion illuminates the other major tendency among uh, the artists I'm talking about, which is an obsession with marketing, advertising, and commodity culture, and the collapse of differentiation between economic and organic processes. Uh, Timur C. Kin is an artist who is sometimes shown alongside Novitskova. Uh, he was uh, in the group show at Daniel Layden that I showed you earlier, um, and who has been a vocal exponent of this particular philosophy. 
Um, here are uh, two works from his Axe Effect series, of which I could probably say quite a bit, but on a certain level they're kind of self-explanatory. Um, they play on the, the infamously cheesy uh, Axe brand marketing campaign, um, which evokes uh, you know, pheromones, and in this work we have a sort of erotic, phallic piercing of the bottles to release streams of uh, oozing, you know, radioactive colored uh, goo, uh, you know, shower gel, shampoo, etc. Um, the point is that for him, branding and marketing is an update of evolutionary strategy. Unilever apparently uses sophisticated retinal tracking and focus group testing during the design of Axe bottles to really maximize their impact at an atavistic level. Um, and uh, on this theme, Seekian wrote an essay in 2013 titled Stock Photography as Evolutionary Attractor, uh, which was published in Dis Magazine, uh, itself an influential organ of post-internet art and lifestyle, um, in which he argued that commercial image conventions have developed in order to tap into evolved predilections and cross-cultural biophysical human propensities in order to stimulate certain emotional states and desires and to influence behavior, i.e. to get people to consume particular commodities. Um, the implication for him is that advertising and marketing are way ahead of art in terms of their ability to arouse responses from viewers. He writes that, quote, artists, including myself, are often inspired by image conventions not to wage war on reified generalities like capitalism or other forms of authority, but rather because image conventions are evidence of deeper primordial processes common to humanity and larger than the individual, end quote. Um, so this is, this is obviously quite an apolitical position, and um, it's it equally explicitly, it's a rejection of what he sees as the orthodoxy of critical theory. Uh, his justification for this position comes from his reading of um, Manuel de Landa, a philosopher associated with new materialism and assemblage theory. I would say, however, that Seekin unfortunately misreads de Landa, whose theories about materiality, about the reality of the virtual, and about emergent causality are far more interesting than Seekin's reductive assertion that human civilization is, quote, an emergent property of the natural world itself. Um, which is a, a deterministic position which quite obviously absolves humans of any agency or accountability in their fate. Um, Seekin is also aware of this, and in a number of interviews he's, he's sort of backpedaled a bit. Uh, for instance, in a recent contribution to Art Forum, he wrote that, uh, quote, saying something is natural doesn't mean that it is morally correct or that we shouldn't work to change it, uh, end quote, and, and that we ought to understand everything from brands to organisms as material with specific capacities and affordances. In that way, he says, a greater understanding of the materiality of culture may lead us towards unlocking its unrealized capacities. Uh, nevertheless, uh, his repeated invocation of new materialist philosophy, specifically to sort of uh, reject the existence of capitalism as a legitimate ontological entity, seems to function mainly as an alibi for his indifference to inequity and exploitation. Um, uh, this is a, another show that is called Basin of Attraction, uh, um, which came out around the same time as his essay on stock photography. Um, uh, Agatha Wara, um, a curator who put Seekin and Novitskova together for her thesis show at CCS Bard, takes an even more extreme position. In her essay, what, what Does Nike Want?, also published in DIS, she wrote, quote, brands share the same evolutionary goal as organisms, that is, to succeed, end quote. Artists, she claims, are like brands in that they have always been competing for attention driven by an equally evolutionary impulse to generate a successful form that will endure and survive over time. To bolster her argument, uh, Wara also cites Manuel Delanda, along with Wired magazine guru slash editor Kevin Kelly, who claimed that, uh, quote, technology is the seventh kingdom of life. Um, and here we arrive at uh, sort of the crux of the matter, uh, which is that these young artists are fascinated, young artists who are fascinated by technology have bought into a variant of the free market libertarianism that's been seducing Silicon Valley for decades. Uh, Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron dubbed it the California ideology uh, in the 90s already, um, for which, uh, quote, the invisible hand of the marketplace and the blind forces of Darwinian evolution are actually one and the same thing. Uh, furthermore, uh, Wara's reduction of art to an evolutionary process of attention seeking voids art of any larger aim or content aside from mere self-replication. It liquidates qualitative evaluation entirely in favor of quantification, measurable in terms of clicks, likes, page, uh, page views, and ultimately dollars. Uh, which brings us to the other critique that's been heard from a number of quarters, that post-internet art represents the commodification of first wave internet art, a rappel à l'orge and a rapprochement with the economy of conventional gallery systems and their exclusionary prestige. Um, I think you could also see it as sort of a a rematerialization of the sort of anonymous image production on Tumblr, something like that. Um, 
But uh, writer and artist uh, Hugh Lemmy has indicted post-internet artists for failing to think on the level of a qualitative scale of relations rather than a quantitative one. He calls it, quote, a massive failure of the imagination to not recognize and pursue opportunities for a culture that is created and distributed on a peer-to-peer -peer framework, end quote. Um, and as a side note, kind of uh, beyond the scope of this paper, it's worth noting that uh, Brad Trammell, who's one of the most visible and increasingly commercially successful artists in post-internet aesthetics, actually called for exactly this kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer model of art in his 2010 manifesto, Free Art, uh, which he presented a lecture on in this exact hall a few years ago. Next door. Next door. Weird. OK, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, less than a year after he uh, wrote that essay and gave this talk, he removed it from his website and scrubbed it from his CV. Um, all of this being the case, uh, why bother talking about this art at all? Um, for one thing, uh, I think Seekin and Wara are actually onto something with their interest in assemblage theory. Now that our reality is per permeated by the virtual, um, the Lambda's assemblage theory gives us a way to think how networks function materially. Post-internet art also at least gestures, if not necessarily successfully, at what I think are real impasses in critical art theory, by focusing on the biophysical and technological conditions that regulate the production, distribution, and reception of art. As Michael Sanchez wrote, quote, instead of institutions producing subjects, today we have apparatuses capturing organisms, end quote. Um, and we need to find a way of accounting for this. Finally, um, in his work on nonlinear history, Delanda also offers the idea of phase transitions, uh, these are not steps in a ladder of progress, but critical thresholds at which a quantitative change becomes qualitative, as with transitions from hunter-gatherer to agriculturalist and agriculturalist uh, to urban societies. The quantitative impact of ubiquitous digital mediation may well be bringing us close to such a threshold. In the field of art, it could poten potentially be as momentous a shift as the great explosion of post-formalist art in the late 60s with the emergence of conceptualism, earth art, anti-form, body and performance art, video art, and so on. What this shift will look like and how we can influence it remains to be seen. What the inevitably misleading uh, post pre sorry, despite the inevitably misleading post prefix, the internet is definitely not over yet. Thank you.